All right. The New Testament passage, the gospel reading for this week is Mark chapter 10, verses 2 through 16. So if you thought the Genesis 2 was kind of touchy, wait till you get into, wait till you get into this gospel reading. Okay, everybody take a deep breath. You ready? Here we go. Mark 10, verse 2. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? The Pharisees were asking, and that's a special Greek word used for asking there, to describe a question that's directed by someone who is in a, in a preferred position socially. And their testing of Jesus was more likely negative because it also says that they were that they tested him by asking. So, you know, this is probably not like, uh, you know, the Pharisees are saying, gee, I, I, I don't know, you know, what the teaching is about divorce. Let's go ask Jesus. No, I don't think so. They came and tested him by asking from their self-elevated position. Now, there could be some legitimacy to that question because within Judaism in the New Testament era, there were two schools of thought. One of them was uh, from Rabbi Shammai, who took uh, Deuteronomy 24 to mean uh, something indecent there to mean uh, very literally uh, somebody who was uh, sexually unfaithful. And then there was Rabbi Hillel who understood it to mean whatever the husband wanted it to mean. So, you know, if he didn't, <laughs> if he didn't like the way you cook breakfast, he could write a thing of divorce and off you would go. And, you know, Hillel is a very significant figure in Judaism. In fact, the um, student uh, fellowship for uh, Jews to st study Judaism on our campus when I was in college was Hillel House. So th this rabbi is uh, quite quite influential. And on so on this subject, you had two very different views of those two rabbis. Now we come to verse three and four, and Jesus says, "What did Moses command you?" They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. So, first of all, it says, what did Moses command you? He replied. So keep in mind that everything that's going to be said here is being said in relationship to a question posed by a group seeking to trap Jesus. Secondly, uh, Jesus asked, what did Moses command? And they replied what, with what Moses permitted. See, there is no command to divorce. There's permission to divorce in Deuteronomy 24. And here's what that passage says, just on the record. <laughs> if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent, about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, and if after she leaves his house he become, she becomes the wife of another man and her second husband dislikes her, and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. Now, in the patriarchal society of Jesus' day, men were treating women like property, like chattel, like servants. And so it's not surprising when Jesus responds in verse 5 of Mark 10, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law Jesus replied, well, what does that mean? Because your hearts are hard. It could, it could mean a lot of things. It could mean that um, you have no compassion for your spouse. It could mean that you aren't able to forgive wrong that's been done to you by your spouse. It could mean that uh, one of you isn't willing to do the work to work through differences and, and issues or to make the changes that need to be made 
for both of you to um, be safe and, and loved in that uh, fellowship. So it's, it's because you live not in the world before the fall, but in the world after the fall. That's, that's why Moses permitted divorce. But now Jesus is going to go even further back to the story we just read. Now remember, Genesis chapter 1 was a form of Hebrew uh, literature, much like our poetry. And it describes poetically God's acts of creation. And then Genesis chapter 2 changes literary form to a narrative form. And now it's going to go back and explain what happened. So it's a lot like, uh, even in this instance, where Jesus would speak a parable or speak a public teaching, and then afterwards he would go and break it down so that the disciples could understand what it was that he had been saying. So now we come to verse 6. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So that's that Genesis 1.27 verse that we read. And then in, in verse 7 he continues, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now the word united uh, that we talked about, uh, the Hebrew meaning, uh, it's pretty interesting when you get to the uh, Greek meaning, uh, proskalithesitai, don't speak Greek, uh, that actually means uh, glued together. <laughs> so uh, God has glued the, the, two, the couple together. Let no one separate. And now we're going back to that concept of being alone, being separated, being, being divided. So Jesus is now turning his perspective from Moses was focused on after the fall people with hard hearts. Jesus is talking about what did God intend before the fall? God intended that marriage would be insoluble. That it would be like that super glue that you can't pull your hands apart if you, you, know, you get it stuck between your hands. You're in trouble, man. And, and that separation if you think about the way that a couple should be united, that separation is very much like amputating a part of your body. And even in situations where amputation is required, it's not desirable. Many years ago when I was in my mid-30s, I... Um, was hit. I was riding my motorcycle and I was hit by an oncoming car and it shattered uh, my left leg. And I was medevaced to the hospital and as I was being wheeled in on the gurney, uh, the two doctors that were inspecting me on the way in, uh, one of them was debating whether or not I had enough circulation to keep my left leg or whether they would need to amputate it. Now, Doctors don't amputate willy-nilly. If they can save your leg, they will save your leg. They know that uh, amputees have challenges that people with all their limbs do not face. It's not something you want to go through. But there are times when to save a life, it is necessary to amputate. Now, when they get back to the house, it's beginning uh, in verse 10 and down through verse 12. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Now, two things. One, Jesus is talking about if you had, if you got a good man and you got a good woman, or you have two good men or whatever your marriage relationship is, if you had two perfect people, then it would be a it would introduce sin in order for them to separate. Okay? And then we come uh, 
to Matthew 19, 9, uh, where we have Matthew's account of this. And in Matthew 19, 9, it says, I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife, and now we have an exception, except for sexual immorality and marries another woman, commits adultery. And Paul <laughs> goes on and he adds another exception in 1 Corinthians 7, 15. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. Oh, so you come to faith. The person you're married to does not come to faith and they're not going to, they don't want to. And they want to leave. Then, according to Paul, let them go. God has called us, Paul says, to live in peace. So the God's goal for you is that you have peace. God's goal for you is that you have fellowship. But God's goal for you is not that you are abused. God's goal for you is not that you are in conflict every day of your life. God's goal for you is not that you open yourself to being hurt, possibly even killed, like the case that has been in the news lately with the um, girl that was um, out in the desert with her fiance. That is not God's goal for you. So there are exceptions that the Bible makes, that even Jesus makes here, because of the fact that we have we live in a fallen world. We ourselves are fallen. None of us are perfect. You've got to be humble enough to accept that. The problem may just be you, right? But for whatever reason, the two of you are not able to live together in peace. And Paul says, let them go. So it's, it's an amputation. Don't get me wrong. It's an amputation. And it's going to hurt and it's going to hurt bad and, and it's, it's going to leave wounds and scars. I, I'm not going to lie to you, but it may allow you to move forward. That wasn't what God intended for us. He didn't intend for us to go through divorce. He didn't intend for us to be in those kinds of destructive relationships. He intended for us to have that equal, corresponding, supportive helper that where we're weak, they're strong, where they're weak, we're strong, and together we're stronger than we would be apart. That's what God intended. And as community, God does not intend for us to be isolated. Don't, don't be ashamed that you had to go through this amputation of your spouse because that's, that's what divorce is. Don't be ashamed of that. You, um, you wouldn't be ashamed if you had to have, if I'd had to have my leg amputated, I would not be ashamed of that. It would hurt, <laughs> it would be a challenge, but it wouldn't be a source of shame. Now, there's kind of no segue here in, in the gospel reading. We suddenly go to a, a story where um, the disciples are turning people away who are bringing their kids to have Jesus bless them. Verses 13 through 16. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Oh, can you imagine Jesus taking you in his arms, placing his hands on you? when you were a child and blessing you? Ooh. Now, in the culture of Jesus' day, children were of the lowest estate. They had no power. 
no position, no authority, very, very little importance to anyone except for their own parents. But when people were being turned away, Jesus was indignant. And that word there for indign indignant means uh, irate, coming out of a place of pain, grief, or affliction. It hurt Jesus to see his disciples do that, and it made him indignant. I think that this is here, one of the reasons that this passage is situated where it is, is because children are just so often lost in the divorce process. Um, the, the, the people going, the adults going through the divorce are in, in a world of hurt. And sometimes they don't think about the fact that their children are in a world of hurt. They need to get support. They need to get counseling. They need to get your attention and your love. I wish that I could have done a better job of that. Uh, when, when I went through my divorce. I, I wish I could have provided better support than I did. That's, that was a failing on my part. But we need to think about how what we're doing is impacting our children and make them a priority. And the last thing we need is the thing that's all too common, where in a divorce process, parents begin to use the children as weapons against one another. Let me tell you, you want to see Jesus indignant? Wait till you have to give an account for doing that. Mm -mm. <laughs> Don't go there, okay? Let's just not go there. Let's keep our children close to us. Second point on this, and, and this is I'm almost ready to close, is Jesus wants children to be blessed. He wants them to be blessed by loving parents. Jesus wants women to be blessed, not losing their financial support and kicked out of their home. Did you know that the number one reason that people go below the poverty line in the United States is divorce? Jesus wants men to be blessed with a partner who completes them and provides help in their areas of shortcoming. And Jesus wants us to bless our children. So I'm going to encourage you. If you have kids, make it a habit to bless them. Uh, at night after we said our evening prayers, I would hug my children to my chest. And I would say, Mommy loves you. Daddy loves you. But Jesus loves you most of all. Go in peace.